Okay, so sexual health, consent, and healthy relationships. This video is brought to you by Achievement Training and Skills, supporting training providers with funding and consultancy to raise standards in the hairdressing, barbering, and beauty therapy apprenticeship delivery industry. Who learnt very much about these kind of things at school? Yeah, not really. Do you think you learnt enough? No, you didn't learn anything. Not enough, but you did cover it. Taught it in science and PSHE. Okay, not enough. So obviously we have 25 minutes today, so I'm not going to cover everything. This is kind of a, a brief overview, but if there are things that you would like me to talk about specifically, um, you can send me a message privately or you can just say in here, um, I know not everybody is comfortable talking about things, so it's up to you. But if there is something that you really think that you'd like me to talk about um, or cover, then let me know. OK, and you can do that through the um, report. Uh, if you go into the report safeguarding, I know it's not safeguarding, but it is to do with that kind of area. So you can do that on the VLE. Okay, so let's start by talking about sexual health. What do you think we're talking about when we talk about sexual health? Any ideas? Being safe, yeah. STIs, yeah, STIs, STDs, um, yeah. AIDS, HIV is an STI. So STI stands for sexually transmitted infection. STD is actually kind of a bit of an old fashioned term now. When I was young, that's what they were called. It was sexually transmitted disease, but now they're called infections. Um, and I guess that's to kind of normalize it really because there's nothing wrong with, if you do happen to get one, it's just dealing with it and making sure that you're safe in the future. So do you think when we talk about sexual health, that's all we're talking about, just keeping ourselves safe from STIs? No? Charlotte, what else do you think it is about? Yeah, Alicia, healthy relationships. Yeah, pregnancy. Yeah, so basically it's anything to do with that kind of relationship, I guess. So it's keeping your mind healthy, keeping your body healthy, being in healthy relationships kind of knowing what to expect from a relationship because you know looking around at other people we're not always influenced by good positive healthy relationships okay so I thought we'd start by talking about the obvious we'll start by talking about STIs what do you think are some of the symptoms and we're not talking specific STIs just some of the kind of general sort of um, symptoms that you could expect to see if you thought you had an STI itching yep sore to pee smells yeah increase of discharge yeah hate that word it's funny isn't it like actually when you talk about words and things so discharge just means to let something out so like if you're in hospital you get discharged and it's funny how when you add it to talking about STIs or sex it suddenly becomes a bit cringy um, yet yeah, some are symptomless that is a very good point so the ones that I've got on my list, discharge, pain, rash, bleeding, itching, blisters and lumps. So they are some of the symptoms that you would notice. But as Charlotte has said, quite a lot are symptomless. So what do you think are the most common 
STIs? Mm, I wouldn't say that HIV is one of the most common. Chlamydia, definitely. Herpes, yep, very common. Okay, so another common one, genital warts. And then not so common, you've got gonorrhea, syphilis. HIV is more prevalent in different groups of people. So you're more at risk of contracting HIV if you are a gay man or there is a high um, infection rate in some third world countries. And actually one of the brilliant things about kind of the advances in medical science is that HIV is actually treatable now. And um, there is a medicine. I guess it is a medicine. There's a there's a kind of you get it from the sexual health clinic. It's called PrEP and people can take it if they think they could potentially be at risk um, and it can help prevent getting it. And also, even if somebody was to contract HIV, it's really treatable now. In fact, they've had people that have had a positive test and they've gone through the treatment and then they have a negative test. So it is definitely through medical advances, it's not what it was say in the 80s. If you suspected that you had an STI, what would you do? Where would you go? Who would you talk to? Phone the doctors? Gum clinic, yeah. I'm guessing that says a and &E. I probably wouldn't go to a and &E because as much as it might feel like a medical emergency, it's not. So if I suspected that I had an STI, um, my first port of call would be probably not to call the doctors. I would find out where my local sexual health clinic was. Um, so I know that local to me in Norwich, it's called the iCash Clinic um, and Suffolk has a called iCash, Bedfordshire, Cambridge are called, and Peterborough are called iCash. I can't speak for the whole country because actually off the top of my head, I don't know. Um, but where we are in this kind of east of England area, they're called iCash. And that stands for Integrated Contraception and Sexual Health. Um, and I would contact them by going on their website and at the moment and actually because most of you are under 25 not everybody um so you would be able well at the moment everybody can get kits online um, because of covid so you can send off get your kit have it sent to your house, it comes in clear, you know, plain packaging so nobody would know what it is, or you could have it sent somewhere, you know, where you felt like it would be safer for it to go to. Um, and you can then do the test yourself. So it's either a swab, um, a urine sample, and then for the HIV one, it's a lancet and um, it's like, uh, click it onto your thumb or your finger and you squeeze blood into a tiny tiny little vial and then you just send it back and you get your results as a text message so what do you think the advantages are of being able to do it yourself do you think that are advantages would you rather do it yourself or would you rather go in somewhere yeah more private saves embarrassment. And who would feel a little bit embarrassed going in and talking about their sexual health? Yeah, a couple of people. I mean, it is, it can be, yeah, a couple more. It can be embarrassing. I think it's, I know when I was younger, I definitely would have been embarrassed. I think as you get older, you just kind of care a bit less because you realize it's just a part of your body and if you need to fix it for whatever reason you know 
these people that work at places like that, they have seen it all before. That's their job many, many times a day. So, you know, I know it's hard to not be embarrassed, but, um, you know, if if you couldn't get something online or if you had to go in afterwards, then it's nothing really to be embarrassed about. In fact, actually, you know, it's good and positive that you are looking after yourself. So how can we prevent STIs? Yeah, using protection. Anything else that you think you could do? Being careful and safe. Do you think that being tested after each new partner would be a good thing to do? Whether you're showing any symptoms or not? No one. It is a good idea. So yeah, if you know, if you after you've changed your partner, um, being tested, whether you show symptoms or not, and actually as well, when you meet a new partner, having a conversation with them, seeing when they last got tested, if they've ever been tested, and kind of, you know, if we can get into a culture of talking about these things, it just becomes more normal. Um, and I'm thinking back to something that somebody said on one of the videos yesterday. It was like visibility, and they were obviously talking about gender, sexuality, but visibility is acceptance. And the more we talk about these things, the kind of easier and more comfortable and just more normal it is to have these conversations. I'm gonna move swiftly on to consent. So what do you think consent is? Permission, yeah? Do you think that, I mean, today we are just talking about mm, a mutual agreement, yeah? So obviously today we are just kind of talking about it in a um, sexual relationship term, but do you think consent is in other parts of our lives as well and in other relationships? Yeah. Where do you think that young children could start learning about consent? Cuddling, kissing relatives, yeah. And I think that's really, really important because I see it quite a lot with people and they're like, oh, give, give your grandma a kiss. And the kids are like, no. And they're like, give your grandma a kiss. So it is, it's like, you know, if they want to, they're being, well, they don't want to, and they're being told they have to do it anyway. So their consent is not being considered. So actually there's a, you know, a, um, a boundary that's been broken. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna play you a really short video. You might have already seen this, but I think it's quite a good way to explain consent. If you're still struggling with consent, just imagine instead of initiating sex, you're making them a cup of tea. You say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they go, oh my God, I would love a cup of tea, thank you. Then you know they want a cup of tea. If you say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they're like, uh, you know, I'm not really sure. Then you can make them a cup of tea or not, but be aware that they might not drink it. And if they don't drink it, then, and this is the important bit, don't make them drink it. Just because you made it doesn't mean you're entitled to watch them drink it. And if they say, no, thank you, then don't make them tea at all. Just don't make them tea. Don't make them drink tea. Don't get annoyed at them for not wanting tea. They just don't want tea, okay? They might say, yes, please, that's kind of you. And then when the tea arrives, they actually don't want the tea at all. Sure, that's kind of annoying as you've gone to all the effort of making the tea, but they remain under no obligation to drink the tea. They did want tea, now they don't. 
Some people change their mind in the time it takes to boil the kettle, brew the tea, and add the milk. And it's okay for people to change their mind, and you are still not entitled to watch them drink it. And if they are unconscious, don't make them tea. Unconscious people don't want tea, and they can't answer the question, do you want tea, because they're unconscious. Okay, maybe they were conscious when you asked them if they wanted tea, and they said yes, but in the time it took you to boil the kettle or brew the tea and add the milk, they are now unconscious. You should just put the tea down, make sure the unconscious person is safe, and this is the important part again, don't make them drink the tea. They said yes then, sure, but unconscious people don't want tea. If someone said yes to tea, started drinking it, and then passed out before they'd finished it, don't keep on pouring it down their throat. Take the tea away. Make sure they are safe, because unconscious people don't want tea. Trust me on this. If someone said yes to tea around your house last Saturday, that doesn't mean they want you to make them tea all the time. They don't want you to come around to their place unexpectedly and make them tea and force them to drink it, going, but you wanted tea last week, or to wake up to find you pouring tea down their throat, going, but you wanted tea last night. If you can understand how completely ludicrous it is to force people to have tea when they don't want tea, and you are able to understand when people don't want tea, then how hard is it to understand when it comes to sex? Whether it's tea or sex, consent is everything. And on that note, I'm going to make myself a cup of tea. Okay, so, I mean, it's... It's a really simple video, but I think it kind of gets it across quite well, you know, just because somebody's wanted it before because they said they wanted it and then they decide they don't, you know, if someone says no at any point, that is their boundary, they're saying no, and that's that. So when it comes to knowing what you want and what you don't want and kind of understanding yourself because I think it's quite easy to kind of understand well not understand but to fall into peer pressure and to think you know I should be doing this um, it's important to think about boundaries so who here knows what a boundary is and I'm really hoping that it's everybody got a thumbs up from Charlotte I'm sure Charlotte's not the only person yeah, an area you don't cross, knowing when to stop. Yeah, so it's knowing what you want and what you don't want. Yeah, so limits people create for themselves. That's a really good way of, of looking at it. So, you know, I know what my boundary is and you know what your boundaries are. And if you're unsure, a good thing to do is think, what do I want, what don't I want and what is a maybe? And then have that discussion with your partner, you know, find out what their boundaries are, because by having those conversations, it's going to keep everybody safer. So quite often, if you are in a relationship or, you know, um, something that doesn't have boundaries or where your boundaries are not respected or perhaps you're not respecting other people's boundaries um you know we would perhaps say that that's not a healthy relationship so looking at healthy relationships I want to us to think about and for you to give me some um words of attributes of healthy relationships now who knows what an attribute is and who knows how to spell attribute yep excellent that is how you spell attribute do you know what it means yeah like a feature feature characteristic so you know if you were going to talk about my attributes you'd say that um, I'm charming I'm particularly you know great at um, delivering things to you in the morning, um, those kind of things, you know. Mm, I wouldn't necessarily say that my dogs are an attribute as such, because it's more about me. You could say that I like dogs, that's an attribute of me. So looking at 
healthy relationships, what are some positive attributes that a healthy relationship could have or a relationship could have? And I'm going to write these down. So respect, yep. Love, yeah. Boundaries, yep. Communication, yes. Kindness, yeah. Support, friendship, yep. So what do you think are some negative attributes that people could have in relationships? Controlling, yep. Selfish, manipulation, bullying, can't express their emotions. Yeah, so poor communication, bad with emotions. Okay, and thinking back to not knowing boundaries, yeah. Thinking back to consent, when it comes to some of the negative things, so let's look at control and manipulation. What kind of things do you think a controlling and manipulating person could do to kind of manipulate somebody's boundaries when it comes to consent? I'm going to add jealousy to the list, Alicia. So somebody who's controlling and manipulative, how could they... So, yeah, they could blackmail them. And any kind of pressure, yeah, definitely. When it comes to blackmail, what do you think they could do? Make them feel like they owe something, yeah. Guilt trips, threaten, gaslighting, yeah. Charlotte, would you like to explain what gaslighting is? And we will talk about that a little bit more when we talk about domestic abuse. I'm guessing that Charlotte is busy typing away. Yeah, so it's a form of emotional abuse. And basically what it is, in a very simple nutshell, is where a partner will make, could be a partner, could be family member, could be friend when we're talking about gaslighting, but it's where one person makes the other person almost believe that what they're experiencing isn't real. So it could be like, you're crazy, that didn't happen. Well, you said that yesterday. So people start to sort of doubt themselves and their thoughts. What would you do if you thought you or somebody that you knew were close to, somebody you work with, were in a not so healthy relationship yeah if it was someone else talk to them see what they think of it I think it's a really tricky one isn't it because actually we don't know the whole story we don't know both people's side of the story they definitely might not want to start the conversation you could report it to safeguarding yeah yeah you could report it to your tutor first it's it's a it's a difficult one to kind of start a conversation I think if it's somebody you're close to it's easier because they probably are disclosing things to you anyway and then you're more in a no what are some of the signs you think that you might see if somebody was in a unhealthy relationship withdrawn yeah it could be totally opposite. It could be that, you know, they're posting all these things on social media about how happy they are, how everything is brilliant. And then you just see a slight kind of difference or you see the way that the other person treats them. And actually it's not like that. So it doesn't always, it's not always that you're looking for those those bad things it could be that people are kind of overcompensating to be like no look we're in a great relationship that kind of thing I know we've only briefly touched on everything today but like I said if there's anything that you think that you would like me to talk about then feel free to put it in the box now or you can get in touch with me privately um, and I can add it in somewhere okay well have a nice day 
I will see you on Monday at nine o'clock. I don't know what we'll be covering because I haven't looked at my timetable. So that'll be a nice surprise for everybody. Um, have a good weekend and I will see you next week. For more videos, make sure to click subscribe.